Uh, welcome, folks, to uh, risk-taking and decision-making across the civil service for optimum results with myself, Casper Berry. I'm going to start by reading the write-up uh, in today's uh, program. It says here, learn how to make decisions and take risks in a highly interactive and practical session hosted by Casper Berry, one of the world's leading advisors. Casper will be using examples from government to offer you the most practical advice on how to calculate your risks and make decisions, what the barriers are in changing the way you currently work, and how to influence others. This is a never-before-seen never session tailored specifically for the civil service. That is a lot to get through in one hour, folks. I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say is that I initially had planned this to be an hour and a quarter. Uh, that would take us through to 5.15. If anyone wants to go at 5 o'clock, that is absolutely fine. And if we have an exodus at that point, then we will wrap the session up slowly. Uh, but if you're prepared to invest another 15 minutes of your time in this, I think exponentially we'll get much more benefit from that additional time. But thank you very much indeed for coming, particularly since we're up against uh, Gus in the other room. So I very much appreciate uh, all of your presence is here. I'm going to ask you, first of all, however, to take your first risk of the day, because we have some people sitting uh, quite spread out at the back. If you're sitting by yourself and not near someone else, if you could stand up, move towards someone else who's sitting by themselves, and just introduce yourselves to them to form some groups of two or three, uh, because I'm going to ask you to have some discussions in those pairs and threes. So if you could do that now, please, folks, for the next 10 seconds, that would be wonderful. And we can just uh, bring you all slightly further forward. Excellent, okay. Hopefully by stepping outside of your comfort zone a little bit there, folks, you've uh, made a new friend. And uh, as I say, you'll be talking to them uh, for most of the next hour. Um, before we start, I would just like to make a couple of points. The first point, I think, is that this session is in itself a risk. Can I start by asking, how many people here saw my presentation last year at Civil Service Live? Anyone at all? Just the one? I think that tells you something. Um, so I just would like to do a very quick overview, therefore, of my life story. I don't want to worry anyone at this stage, but uh, here I am talking to you all. I actually started off my working life uh, as an actor in the very first two series of that program there. Yes, Geordie Teen Soap, Biker Grove. Always gets a little laugh, I've noticed. What I would say to those people laughing, madam, is that I was paid to be in it, but you watched it for free, didn't you? So who has the last laugh now? Uh, if you didn't watch it, folks, that is me there at the age of 16, 20 years ago now, almost to the day. Uh, the program is not famous, of course, for launching my career, but it is famous for launching that of my co-stars at that time. There they are, a cherubic-looking Anton Deck there. Uh, 20 years, 18 years before the phone scandal, which very nearly brought them down, I like to think. Uh, not that I'm bitter at all about this. Let's just forward wine slightly and see where we all are today. Well, that's them. ITV1 primetime. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Britain's Got Talent. Seminal shows. 12 to 14 million viewers. Uh, that's me, by contrast, on Sky Channel 843. Uh, 12 to 14 viewers we get on a good night. Um, and all their pets. So... Something's gone very wrong, hasn't it? Actually, just to uh, allay some of your uh, fears, uh, I am uh, a risk consultant, if you like, for some of Britain's best companies. And I do a speech which I would say has been finely honed over the last five years, and I'm very used to doing it. But today, and indeed on Tuesday, a couple of days ago, I decided myself to take a risk, to step outside of my comfort zone, to move away from the structures of that speech that I've become very used to, and to try and create a slightly more interactive session here. Most of the time, I turn up to an organization, I speak to them for an hour, maybe three hours, and then I say, OK, folks, you're on your own, and I walk out the door. And what I never really get a sense of is the conversations that follow. In other words, how practically are we going to embed and inculcate some of this into our organization? It's all very well talking about the theory of risk-taking, but what we want to get to today is some of the practice, folks. So if we don't get a sense of that, I know an hour and a quarter is still a very short amount of time, but if we don't get a sense of that, then I feel that we failed. So I'm going to need your help and the help of my fantastic panel in order to do that. Second big point, I think, to say is that by risks, we mean personal, cultural, and developmental risks. So as much fun as this looks, I'm not asking anyone to embrace those kind of risks into their lives, all right, folks? Risks can be dangerous. There are consequences and hazards, and that is not for us. I don't know if you remember this photo. It went round on email about two years ago. There was some debate about whether it was real or not. Uh, in the end, the photographer won an award. So I think it, I think it is real. I don't think that is. I don't think, that's, 
I don't think that's a real image, folks, but that is someone there embracing risk into their lives. We do not want those things to happen, and therefore, I want to start by sharing with you something that I learned about risk uh, 30 years ago now, uh, when I was six years old. Every Sunday, my father and I used to go boating, uh, and I want you to picture the scene for a moment. Very idyllic, sunlight streaming through the trees, father-son bonding happening there on the boating lake, and then one Sunday, all of this was thrown into jeopardy because someone had an accident. I don't know to this day exactly what happened, but it was enough to throw the council into a panic. Did they have the necessary insurance? Were they going to have to put lifeguards around the lake? They didn't know, but being a council, they sprung into action. They erected a sign. I will never forget this sign. It has a picture of a man falling out of a boat and into the water, and underneath the picture with the immortal words, remember, boating is fun until death occurs. <laughs> now, I don't know to this day how appropriate a caveat that is for boating, but it's very appropriate, I think, for risk-taking. Risk-taking, uh, in all its forms, is great fun until death occurs. So please let those words ring in your ears by way of indemnification. Now, there is actually a serious message in that, and that is that for all of us here in this room, personally and professionally, there is a degree of risk which is unacceptable. There are decisions which you just wouldn't or maybe can't take. And no one, and least of all me, is asking you to cross this line. What I think is interesting, however, is that a long way away from that line, that area of unacceptability, there is an area here that we'll call our comfort zone. It's where, broadly speaking, we're happy, we're comfortable, we're taking decisions that we take on a daily basis, and we're fairly sure that we know what the outcomes are going to be most of the time. But what that means, therefore, folks, is that between those two areas, there is an area of potential risk, potential hazard, potential consequence, but also potential opportunity. And that's the word that I'd like to be focusing on today, the value of an opportunity. Because I think we're all aware in some part of our minds that by stepping out of our comfort zone every now and again, we are able to seize some of those opportunities. Not every time will that act be successful. But in the long term, by stepping out of our area of comfort, we gradually learn and develop and grow as people and as organizations. In fact, I would argue that the only way that we learn and grow and develop as organizations is by stepping outside of that comfort zone. So one of the big questions that we need to ask ourselves today and try and get some answers to is why we don't do it more often. What is it uh, inside us that actually stops us from doing that? So, uh, next thing very quickly before we, uh, before we kick off properly. We're going to explore both the theory and the practice. As I said, um, the talk that I usually deliver is more focused on the theory. I think there's a value to that because I think it's really important for us to understand some really in interesting elements uh, of this subject that we call risk and risk-taking, and also some of the psychological factors behind our decision-making process. We tend to think long and hard about some of the decisions that we actually make, but I would challenge us to ask ourselves the question, how much time do we really spend thinking about our decision-making process? What is it that brings us to those decisions? And why can we very often be sitting in a room with colleagues that we work with every day, and yet they're making a very different decision to us? They're coming to very different conclusions. What is it that uh, causes that? So we're going to combine that with a little bit of the practice. We're going to ask ourselves, well, what does that mean for us on our daily basis? And try and fuse those two together in a very limited amount of time. Uh, some of the theory that you will uh, hear today, I learnt as a professional poker player. A uh, quick show of hands, do we have anyone who plays poker here in this room? A couple there. Anyone who's never played poker before? Yep, they're the bluffers, I find. Beware of them. They're the really dangerous ones. Uh, poker's become very sexy now. I started playing in the year 2000, long before this poker boom that you're all uh, aware of. Uh, there are now more and more uh, young people getting into poker. I think this is fine. I'm happy that there are you know, poker societies in most of the universities in Europe and America. I do worry about slippery slope, though, folks. How long is it before we see that? Hey? That's my question. He's having a good time. Does that make it right? Hmm? So the key point that we're going to make about poker is that, of course, when we're playing poker, we can be taking a series of calculated risks. And of course, a professional poker player wants to be making a living, making a profit in the long term on the investments that he makes. But we can also be gambling. And really, the key point of today's session is to take the gamble out of the decisions that we make. And hopefully, what I'll show you today, I think, is that very often not taking a decision, standing still, inert, is actually the biggest gamble that we can take of all. 
I'm going to ask you very much for your uh, participation, so please be generous with that. And I'm just going to be a little bit school teachery for a moment and ask you to just do two things as you do that. Please be specific, as specific as possible, otherwise conversations just sort of stay in the clouds about uh, general theories and perceptions and what we really want are your actual real-life experiences, uh, which uh, my panel are going to try and uh, talk about. And also, let's be constructive. Because it's very possible when we talk about risk and risk-taking for anyone in any organization, private or public sector, to say, well, look, I would like to take risks, but no one will let me. And I've seen those conversations hundreds and hundreds of times, and they're perfectly valid. In order to get to somewhere else, we certainly need to be honest about where we are. But let's always try and be future-focused and ask ourselves exactly what we can do in order to achieve that. Right, I've uh, talked a little bit too much now, so let's just focus on what we're going to be answering today to discover how, why, and when to take appropriate calculated risks within the civil service. That's what we're all going to be focused on. And what I'd like to do now is introduce to you our panel. Um, these are the people who are really going to be providing the, um, the practical flesh of today's session. I hold my hands up from the off and say that whilst I have worked with uh, a few departments within the civil service, it's not an area of speciality of mine, so please don't expect me to be able to uh, be forthcoming on and practicalities like that, although I will try and do whatever I can on the theory. But we have three fantastic uh, members of the panel here who've been selected because they represent what I feel are three, um, not comprehensive, but three quite specific, distinct, and common views or experiences. Uh, I'll ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment, but for, the, for, for now, I'd like to introduce to you Eleanor Goodison at the far end, and we selected Eleanor because she's going to be very, very brave and represent, I don't know if you don't mind me saying this word again, the layer of permafrost that Gus O'Donnell has uh, talked about on a number of occasions. In other words, uh, a person within the civil service or a kind of perception of a, 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 a mindset that is resistant to change. And Eleanor has, as we say, very bravely agreed to talk about that from the perception of someone who may have uh, held some of those views uh, during her time within this organization. Ellen, would you like to tell us a bit about your experience here? OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've been in the civil service for nearly 31 years, um, mainly based in the cabinet office and similar departments, working on civil service management and public service reform. Um, I've been a private secretary to a minister. I've also been finance director of an executive agency. Um, and just in my own defense, since I've been cast as permafrost, <laughs> I am leaving the civil service at the end of next week and um, setting up my own business. So I'm not that risk averse. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Eleanor. Uh, can I now introduce you to uh, Andrew Templeman uh, to my immediate right? Andrew is here representing, if you like, someone within the organization who has a track record for pushing through a large amount of change uh, and innovative projects and who will be able to talk to us about a little bit about how he has done that in the past. Andrew, if you could talk to us about your experience, please. I always hate it when you hear these descriptions. You think, oh, I'm not so sure I've done <laughs> any of that. Um, my background is Cabinet Office. Um, I've worked in a variety of different roles, um, quite a lot of which were quite unpopular with the people I worked with. The lines, I, I'm from the Cabinet Office and here to help doesn't really run too well. Um, I worked on capability reviews, so marked quite a lot of departmental homework. Um, I also used to work in the delivery unit. Um, which again was working with departments around trying to deliver improvement, balancing risk and innovation. So I'm still trying to work out how we do that better and trying to get a better appreciation of, of how we can work better. But also like um, Eleanor, I must declare the fact that I've just left the civil services now on the end of day four in the private sector. It may not be too late for me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you very much indeed. And finally, folks, uh, Jonathan Miller. Uh, Jonathan is representing the views of someone who's relatively new into the civil service um, and who may be feeling a bit frustrated by some of the impediments to pushing change and innovation and personal risk taking. And Jonathan, if you'd like to give us a bit of background on yourself. Yes, so I've just arrived. I've been here two and a half months. I'm the Director of Learning Delivery at the National School of Government. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years or so in the private sector, mainly working for top brand international companies. I've spent the last six years in Airbus, leading the, the people aspects of the merger that created uh, Airbus. Um, I originally trained as an engineer. I think I've been worked mainly in uh, sort of people development, HR, change. Change is really the, the key thread of, uh, of my career so far. And that was certainly what attracted me to this role, the change agenda for the civil service and the change agenda for the national school itself. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. So they are our panel today. Very, very quickly, these are the six or seven questions we're going to be asking. What is a risk, and what kind of risk do we take in the civil service? Why do we need to take risks? What stops us from taking risks generally, and in the civil service in particular? And critically, of course, the key question for today, the constructive uh, point of view on this, is how can we change this? What practical things can we do in order to change this? Uh, we may, if we have some time at the end, asking for some volunteers. If anyone has a change that they want to push through and they'd like their progress documented, if we don't have time uh, for that during the actual session, then please come up and talk to me at the end. But we will, of course, make time for some uh, conclusions and a bit of summary. So without any further ado, let's kick off by asking question one, which is a three-part question. I'm going to ask you to discuss this in your pairs for about one and a half minutes. Three parts to it. What is a risk, first of all? How would you define a risk? Give yourself uh, 12 words or less. What sort of risks do we take within the civil service? Being specific, what sort of risk are you proud that you have taken or that your team have taken? And then what sort of risks do we not take? Maybe risks that we feel that we should or maybe risks that are unacceptable and that, therefore, we're proud that we don't take. 90 seconds, and then we will get a sense of what you've been talking about. Are there any questions? Then let's begin. Thank you very much indeed, folks. Thirty seconds left. Thirty seconds, folks. Ten. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So hopefully uh, you had a little bit of a chance to share some ideas there. And if you didn't have a chance to speak in your group there, I hope you'll uh, be forthcoming in just a moment. I'd just like to start, uh, kick this off, if you like, just by talking about uh, that first question, what is a risk because um, actually one of the things that I've learned with working with so many people is that you know what the human body is basically a decision making machine we take hundreds arguably thousands at a subconscious level of decisions every single day we make so many decisions that it's actually quite difficult for us to focus on exactly what a decision is but I'd like to put something on the table for a moment for us to consider and that is the concept that all decisions are investment decisions all decisions are investment decisions. All those risks and decisions that you were just talking about there are situations in which we were investing, and we tend to think of that word investing as being about money, and sometimes those are the decisions that we're making, but very often money is not the limited or scarce resource that we are choosing to invest in a particular opportunity or person or experience. The other great scarce resource is, of course, time. That's what we're investing on a daily basis. Energy, passion, attention, and then, as soon as we start talking about decisions which are made within organizations or where we become accountable to family or friends or peers or colleagues, the great scarce resources that we have are status, reputation, respect, self-respect, what in Asian countries they call a sense of face. And all of those things are on the line whenever we make a decision. And we live in a world of uncertainty. We never know exactly when we make a decision what the result of that particular decision is going to be. Not every restaurant that we go to is going to serve the greatest meal we've ever had. Not every person we bring into our team is going to go on to become employee of the month. 
And what's interesting is that actually our subconscious minds are very attuned to that uncertainty. We make decisions in that world of uncertainty every single day. I'd like to show you this, if you'll permit me, by, of course, using the metaphor of the popular Channel 4 game show Deal or No Deal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, do we have any fans of Deal or No Deal here in the audience today? We've got a couple of people brave enough to put their hands up. Thanks very much indeed, because most of the time I have to say, how many people have ever caught Deal or No Deal when in someone else's house, in their lounge, on a television, in the corner by mistake? Do we have any hands up answering that question honestly? Come on, ladies and gentlemen, we've all seen Deal or No Deal from time to time. If you haven't seen it, uh, then you won't be familiar with the groundbreaking format that involves Neil, uh, Noel Edmonds uh, and a contestant and a screen that looks like this. Uh, 22 boxes, each containing anything from one penny to £250,000. How is this a metaphor for our decision-making process? Because at each stage, the contestant needs to make a decision. They need to place a value on the box that they have chosen that could contain a series of amounts of money. That will be the result, if you like, that they will accrue from their decision. So let's just imagine that we were... I do apologise... My slides seem to have broken there. It's the first time it's ever happened. I'm just going to come out of the program for a moment. Let's just imagine that we were playing a game of deal or no deal. No, it seems to have broken. Uh, well, that's a bit of a pain. If you can see those amounts there, they are, there are 10 boxes there. I've got They're each containing from 20,000 down to 10. If I flick that, there you'll be able to get a sense of what that is. Um, and I'm just imagining that you've got a situation now where you have four boxes left. You're playing the game deal on a deal, and you have four boxes left, and they contain anything from 5,000 to 2,000. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this situation here as a decision. How much would you pay to buy that box? At least 2,000. That's what you'd invest, at least, because that's your minimum return. Would you pay 3,000 pounds? Would you pay 4,000, maybe 4,500 in the hope that you're going to open the box that's 5,000? I'd say probably most of you are around about the 2,000 mark. That's a decision. The possible outcomes are quite limited and contained. Let's just imagine now that we were in this situation in the game. Two of the boxes now contain very large sums of money, 20,000 and 10,000. That's the return that we could accrue. However, two of the boxes now contain very little. They would represent, if you like, failures. This is what a risk is. A risk is not just any old decision that we take on a daily basis. It's a decision where we have to make an investment into an opportunity which could yield tremendous returns and gains, but which could also yield nothing at all, maybe even lose some of those precious commodities that we've invested into it. I've drawn an analogy. Let's just imagine that you're on holiday in Holland for a moment and you're deciding what to have for lunch. That represents safety and security. You know what you're going to get with a Big Mac. You might not like it, ladies and gentlemen, but you know it's going to be the same whether you eat it in London or Holland or Beijing. Right next to the McDonald's is a little cafe. And I've chosen that photo because it doesn't look like the best cafe in the world, does it? But who knows whether that cafe is going to do the best spaghetti bolognese you've ever tasted or it's some kind of tourist trap that's going to take your money and feed you almost nothing at all. The McDonald's is the certainty. The cafe is the risk. What risks do we take in our lives, personally and professionally, particularly with regards to the civil service? Do we have any hands at all? Who'd like to share with us some concepts of some risks that they have taken? At this point in my normal sessions, I have poker chips to give out as rewards. And you tend to find a lot more hands go up in the air. I can tell you, it's almost a Pavlovian response. In this case, I'm going to go to the panel. But please, 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 folks, do be forthcoming in a moment. Andrew, what sort of risk do you think that we take? Um, I think it's a kind of negative, actually. I think the risks we take are the risks we don't take by embracing the, the, the improvement we can take by moving on. We can tend to hold a holding pattern the comfort of what we know. Um, and then at the other extreme, we take huge risks where we embark on huge programs um, on a bit of a wing and a prayer with a kind of uneasiness around some of the, the stuff that could happen or might happen. Uh, but it's kind of close your eyes and keep going and hope that it carries on. So we're kind of schizophrenic around it, I think. It's interesting. I have, I've been talking to people in the, in the last couple of days, and I, I have got that sense of feedback, actually. They say exactly that, that we do, at a, at a very high level, we take big risks and maybe we could define some of those as gambles, 
but if you ask for something quite small and uh, you know, with a very small downside, people's level of personal uh, risk to just invest a small amount of money or time into a little scheme or opportunity is limited. So that's, that's what you're saying. Yeah. You would agree with that. Okay, great. Uh, Jonathan, what are your feelings? Uh, I can give an example of a, a risk that we're currently looking at at the National School. We're run as a fully cost recoverable organization, so although we're a non-ministerial department, we have to recover all of our costs. We're a business in that sense. We have feedback that our prices are sometimes too high. Um, so one of the things that we're contemplating is do we lower our prices? Now that is very much a kind of gamble in the, the two end uh, spectrum that you show. If we get it right, uh, our volume of sales goes up and it's good news and we, uh, it's easier to balance the books. If we get it wrong and we don't sell any more, then uh, clearly we're in a more difficult situation. So that's certainly a very real uh, risk that we're contemplating at the moment. Great, excellent. So there's obviously an upside and there's a potential for downside. I want to pick you up on a, on a word that you use there because it's a word that obviously as a professional poker player for three years I used to hear a lot and that is the word gamble. And here is what a gambler is doing, folks. A gambler is investing money. We don't think of them as investments because obviously we call them bets. But a bet is a kind of investment into a series of opportunities presented by blackjack or roulette where, and let's make no bones about this or even make light of it, they will lose money in the long run. Why do people do it? Rationally, because they're buying fun. They're buying utility or satisfaction, as economists call it. But as far as the commodity they're actually investing, they will make a loss. We do tend to use the word gamble when applied to risks like this. So as soon as there's a, a high upside and a high downside, that word tends to come out. But I always want to try and move us away from it because gamblers lose. And risk takers, even though we may lose on this particular occasion, in fact, we're going to lose 50% of the time, risk takers, like all decision makers, try and make their investment decisions in such a way where in the long term, they make a net gain. So in actual fact, you were talking about that, that that gamble, if you like, there. Do you think that is a long-term gamble, or do you believe that in the long-term, a series of decisions, some of which may fail, will result in a better long-term outcome? Uh, I think it could do. I mean, something we need to analyze quite carefully, and, and uh, it, it's complex in terms of the rest of the market and who's doing what and the current situation in the civil service around uh, uh, budgets and so on. So the, there is a long-term potential, uh, but it is definitely a risk. OK, great. Eleanor. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> One of the uh, risks that we often take in the civil service is to, um, uh, to introduce change initiatives um, at the same time as we are asking people to perhaps do more with less, as we're, most of us are being asked to do in the current economic climate. Um, so the, there's a big risk that uh, the change initiative will actually distract people from the day job and from delivering uh, excellent services uh, to the public. So in terms of the investment of time, they're investing it in a constant change program and not actually delivering the things that are necessary on a day-to-day -day basis? That's the possibility, yes. Okay, great. In, in, you, you've had 30 years' experience in the civil service, and I've got two questions. Do you think, A, that happens now more than it used to, and B, uh, do you think that that happens a significant period of the time, or are you saying that it's always a danger? Uh, I'm saying I think it does happen more than it used to. Um, uh, I think that sometimes, sometimes uh, change initiatives are counterproductive in that way. Um, and then there are other times, of course, when they are successful. So sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Folks, I really want some, uh, some thoughts from you. So what risks, in light of what we've just heard there, do you think that we take? And what risks do you think that we don't? Do we have anyone at all? Yes, fantastic. Can we get the microphone here, please? It's a, very, it's a very big room, so you're going to need a microphone, I think, to be heard at all. Just there. I'd agree with what um, Eleanor's just said about the, um, the change. Um, I'm in Revenue and Customs, and we're in the section I'm in, Business Tax, we're introducing um, Pacesetter, which some of you may um, have heard the word lean, and sort of streamlining processes and looking at resource and forecasting uh, workloads and that. And I think there's a risk there with how people will work with that change. Um, and it's about getting people on board as well. Um, so I think that, that's probably one of the biggest risks that we've taken. Are you saying one of the risks is that people actually won't embrace the change? Yeah, and how do we then encourage them? Okay. To motivate them? Okay. So between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things, there's what some change analysts call a crazy time. Yeah, where some people are working the new way and some people are working in the old way. Yeah. And would I be right in saying that that is painful? It's confusing. Yeah, I would think that staff um, 
do see it as that um, when it's sort of seeing the wood from the trees kind of thing and, and reaching your destination because it's all about continuous improvement and that change is, is continuous. Good, excellent. One of the things I hope to discuss during this session is the fact that when you play poker, you can be the world champion poker player, you will still have to lose 40% of the hands that you play. You can make a million dollars at the end of every year, you will still have to lose 40% of every single hand that you play. In other words, you're investing your limited resources, your poker chips, into a series of opportunities that we call hands. You still have to lose 40% of the hands that you play, and in the long term, you'll make a great gain on those investments. What's interesting is that human beings are risk averse, because it doesn't matter whether you're just starting in the game or you're the world champion, you know what, those 40% of hands, they always hurt. It's always painful. Now, this is not to say, by the way, that your particular example that you're, uh, you're talking about is going to lead to that long-term gain. But I think what, it is, what is interesting is that in order to get to any long-term gain, we need to be prepared to go through some pain in the short term. And because we're risk-averse, and I'm going to show exactly why, psychologically, with a few numbers we are, we tend to give very undue emphasis to those short-term pains on the altar of long-term gain. Thank you very much for a wonderful point. Does anyone else have a quick point before we move on? Yes, sir. Microphone in the middle. Thank you very much indeed. I think one of the big risks is actually having to make tech decisions with inadequate information. Right. So you can never, you can, you can wait forever to get perfect information. Usually the world moves on too fast. Ministers want to do things or push things forward. And you're always trying to make some balances about whether you have enough information to actually manage the risk and move forward. Great. So um, I'm using here silly figures on the, uh, on the front of a picture of a, uh, a Dutch uh, cafe. But if we don't have any kind of data which can put some numbers in the boxes, what you're saying is, how can we make a decision at all? We're dealing there not just with uncertainty, but unknowns, which some uh, philosophers of risk will put in a completely different category. So a fantastic point. Does anyone here on the panel have any comment to make about that? Jonathan. I think this is an absolutely key issue, because I think that you know, as time goes on, we get more information, but we also have fewer options. And I, I think this is what the, the great risk takers, the great entrepreneurs are very, very good at. They're very good at spotting change, somehow sensing enough information to make their decisions before all the options are closed down. And I think sometimes the sort of massive analysis that we do as a kind of comfort to make sure we get it right actually becomes a greater risk in the end because it closes down our options. I do a lot of work with the, or have done a lot of work in the past, with the Environment Agency. Uh, does anyone here work? with or for the Environment Agency. Um, and they were very honest you know, when they brought me in. They said, uh, we feel, and they're absolutely right, that we are a group of uh, very committed uh, experts in our field who want to do uh, good things in, in the, uh, the world that we, um, in which we live and exist. But we feel that we do become paralyzed by analysis when making some of our decisions. And we need all the information before we do anything at all. And again, I hope to get to, at the end, uh, a sense of how people take any decisions is because at some point in their mind, a little voice inside them says, what happens if I never do this? What happens if I never choose anywhere to eat lunch? I'll starve. What happens if we never bring anyone new into this team? Our department will disappear. What happens if I never cross the room and ask anyone if they'd like to go on a date? I'll be single for the rest of my life. And those feelings, those thoughts of what happens if I never take this risk, become great enough to motivate us to do what in actual fact feels like quite a risky thing to do. The relevance of the Environment Agency is that in times of, we'll call it peace, when nothing much is happening, they need all this information because they become par paralyzed by the potential consequences of making a decision. But when Britain goes underwater, whatever it says on the front page of the Daily Mail, they make a series of brilliant, fast decisions. They are excellent decision makers. And they make those decisions because a little voice inside their head says, if you don't make some decision now, people will die. And some of the decisions that they actually make may lead to one or two fatalities. But by making that series of decisions in a time of uncertainty where they do not have all the information, because of the expertise they have and because of the quality of their decisions as decision makers, they get a long-term gain. And they do an amazing job in times of crisis. Fantastic point. I'd like to move on, if that's okay, sir, but you can, uh, I'm sorry, you can work your point into this Kester, next question. I want, to, yes. I want to challenge you on that a bit, yeah. because you, what you describe there is quite a negative view of risk-taking. You say there's a little voice that says, hey, if you don't decide soon, then uh, you're never going to get anywhere. Uh, I suspect there are also, there is a voice or a feeling inside that sometimes says, 
go for it, I want to do this. Now, that's not, not a, a motivation that says if I don't, then I'm stuck or I'm not going to get anywhere. No, it's absolutely the reverse. not. It's a positive. Uh, I think you reach a point inside often where you just know, I'm going to do this. There are, uh, in fact, just go back to that last slide, there are two things here. There's the upside and the downside. And what you're talking about there is, is the vision. It's people being drawn towards something, taking a decision because they want all the upside. I'm going to set up my own business because I want to uh, you know, be autonomous and in control and all the rest of it. Um, and that's great. And that's a very powerful motivating force. But unfortunately, because humans tend to be risk averse and we put more weighting on downsides, the sense of what will happen in the long term, the downside of never taking a decision, can sometimes be a more powerful motivating force. Now, that's not to say that it's negative, because what you do is you embrace that sense. I, I, I told a story last time, we're spending a little bit of time discussing this, but there's a, there's a very interesting story which I think sums this up. Uh, I was doing a session about two months ago with an entrepreneur, and uh, at the age of 35, he had everything that he wanted in his life. Uh, he had the money, he'd sold his company, beautiful house, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful um, a garden, and a lawnmower that was the lawnmower of his dreams. And um, he spent two years just sort of in semi-retirement and thought that his life was wonderful and perfect. And then he decided to put it all on the line again, all the money, the relationship with the family, and everything to set up another company. And we all said to him, why? Why did you do that? And he said, even though he had a vision, he had confidence, and he was a, a great risk taker, he said he had a moment where he was sitting on his lawnmower at the age of 37, chugging up and down the, the garden, and he said, if I don't do it all again, this is all I'm going to have for the next 30 years. Now, I don't think that's a negative feeling. I don't think that's a destructive feeling. I think it was a moment of, of impetus and motivation. But I can see that you might, you might regard it as a negative thing. OK, to move on to the next, uh, next question. Next question is that, folks. Why do we need to take risks in the civil service? So does this have a relevance to what you were going to say? Can you work it into this in a cunning way? Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which I would say is probably less so uh, in the private sector where there's a little more continuity, you think. Good. Does anyone have any thoughts on this? Why do we need to take risks? Yes, sir. Microphone here at the front. Uh, uh, yeah, I think the uh, consequences of this decision that you take in the civil service are possibly a bit different to the consequences in the private sector. And that's all built into your decision making process. What are the consequences of this going wrong? Oh, I'll still have a job afterwards. I can, I can simply do something. In the private sector, it's a bit sharper, perhaps. I, I don't know if that's, a, if that's a characteristic of the civil service. The Good. Security. That's, that's an interesting point. So what you're saying is that makes people more risk-embracing, do you think, as a result of that? Is they, they're prepared to do things that they might not be prepared to do in the, in the private Ooh, sector? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it, perhaps there isn't the same uh, risk, in, risk of... If you get it wrong, there's a safety net there for you in the civil service, which influences your decision about taking the risk. You see, it's interesting what you're saying, because I, again, I've had some conversations with this, uh, about this with, with a couple of people, and they've said a similar thing. But the upshot of that should be that more people will embrace more risks, if there is less perception of the downside. You, you'd think so, wouldn't you? What, what, I, what I experienced, well, absolutely. So, so that doesn't, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a disconnect there in some way. What I experienced working with one team within the civil service is that the senior director said to his team, just name the last time that someone was given a P45 for doing something which turned out to be wrong. The point that he was making was that people, whilst that was the reality, that people were still paralyzed by the fear that that would happen. Would that be a fair, a fair comment? Let's just answer this question, because that's going to come on to what stops us, which is, a, which is also great. But why do we need to? Yes, the microphone right at the back, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, over there, you've got two microphones wending their way to you. If you can give them to the, both the gentlemen with their hands up, that'd be fantastic. Gentlemen in the front, first of all, please. Thank you. Um, I think the um, civil service um, has to take risks because we do things that the private sector either can't do or won't do, so therefore we've got to take those risks because if we don't, then nobody else will. Then nobody else will. A great point. Thank you very much indeed. And the gentleman behind you. 
Yes, I'd like to follow on from that. I mean, we have statutory obligations, you know what I mean? Um, but I would say that having worked in private, private sector, in a law firm, they do take risks. And when they fall, they fall. But I would say in the civil service, we have to do something. Otherwise, there's consequences of not doing something afterwards. Great. And I'm going to come to those. Jonathan, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Why do we need to? Uh, I've got lots of thoughts around the discussion over there. I, I'm interested in what kind of people are attracted to the civil service. You know, do you come to this safe, you can't get fired environment because that means you can take more risks? Or do you, and I suspect it's more the latter, you come here because you don't particularly like taking risks, and uh, if you enjoyed risk-taking, maybe you'd be somewhere else. Okay, so that culture could, could, could lead to that in that case. Yeah. In terms of the need, in terms of the need, Jonathan, why do you think we need to? Well, in terms of the need, I, I think it's a very, very interesting time to be in the civil service right now, and it's one of the reasons I joined. That the, many of you will know of, of Charles Handy and his management books, and I'm sure you know of this, the story of the boiling frog. Do people know the boiling frog story? Nobody, no. Right? Who's well, boiled frogs? Just give it to us quickly. Apparently, and I've never tried this, but if you put a, a frog into a bowl of water and you start to heat it, the water warms gradually. Because frogs actually can't tell when there's only a small change in, in temperature as opposed to a sudden change in temperature, they actually don't notice. So the water will get hotter and hotter until the frog actually boils and dies. Uh, whereas if you drop it into hot water, it will try and uh, jump out. But my impression, and I'm, I'm uh, probably not being very diplomatic or <laughs> polite here, but then I come from the private sector, is that I think you know, in the past in the civil service, actually a lot of people have been very successful by not taking risks. Somebody mentioned about the disconnect between you know, policy and delivery, and, and you've moved on before anything is actually delivered. You know, I meet a lot of very, very clever people who are extremely, and we had this a bit in Airbus, to be fair, because Airbus was a very political company with uh, national governments as shareholders, uh, very adept at actually uh, avoiding taking risks and building whole careers on that. I actually think now that is the equivalent to being the frog sitting in the water. And the reason for that is the next election and the cost cutting that's going to come, whichever government gets in, that's going to come on the back of that. Uh, and I, I believe that those who are now prepared to take risks, uh, be innovative, all of the stuff that we're hearing from Gus and others uh, to make things change, they'll be the people that survive uh, and that do well and thrive. And that's different, I think, from uh, how success has been here before. So there may be a kind of, uh, it's a new, use another jargon word, paradigm change going on here. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. And a little bit of theory to, uh, to back up there what Jonathan's saying. Uh, effectively, what I talked about at the beginning of this session was the value of an opportunity. The value of an opportunity. Let me just expand upon that. Let's just uh, look at this decision situation in Deal on a Deal now. And let's just imagine that we're making a series of decisions like this. Sometimes we're going to open up the box and the result is going to be 5,000. Sometimes we're going to open up the box and the result is going to be 2,000. What is the value of that decision? Well, in actual fact, according to the science of risk, there is an objective value. It's actually very simple. It's just the average of all of those amounts. But we work it out in a slightly more complicated way. We say there are four possibilities, four possible outcomes in this situation. Therefore, each of them is 25% likely. Apologies to anyone who hates maths at this point. And therefore, you multiply each of those amounts by 25%, and you add up that total, and it gives you a value of 3,500. That's quite simply the value that you're going to get if you carry on making decisions like that. The value of this risk, the value of stepping outside of our comfort zone and sometimes experiencing some great rewards, but sometimes experiencing some failures, the value of that, if we multiply each of those amounts by 25%, is considerably more, more than twice as much more. In other words, if we carry on taking decisions like that that are a little bit more risky, where there are lots of good psychological impediments or good reasons to stop us from doing it, in actual fact, we're going to get greater long-term returns. So why will those people be favoured in a new paradigm? It's because in the long term they'll be achieving more even though they will be quotes unquote failing 50% of the time. So with that in mind, given that there is a need and given that we have uh, a mandate to return value to the British taxpayer and to, as you say, to fulfil the roles that the private sector won't fulfil, let's ask ourselves what stops us from taking risks generally, and in the civil service in particular. Let's just have uh, 90 seconds again, just discussing this with the person sitting next to you. What stops us from taking risks? Let's get to grips with it. Thank you. 
any of you have a point that you want to make, please put your hand up and I'll, and I'll bring you up. They got it. The illusion. They got it. <laughs> I've never read it. <laughs> I know well, it. Well, I've lived to all ten of them, so I don't think I need to. All oh, right. <laughs> well, I used to do. I used to do thought for the day. That was good enough for me. <laughs> I don't know why it stopped. Just like, why? He must be quite elderly now. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds, folks. <laughs> Ten. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Okay. Another little bit of theory. Uh, I'm going to answer the first part of that question again, uh, which is what, takes, what stops us from taking risks generally, before I throw it open to you to tell us what stops us from taking risks in the civil service in particular. Um, I would say, as someone who's worked with both the private and the public sector, that we can, we can endlessly talk about the differences between them, and I'm sure there are vast differences, many of which I'm unaware. I would say that people are still people at the end of the day, and psychology uh, has a lot to teach us about the way that we all are and why we do what we do. Broadly speaking... When we make decisions, when we make decisions, we are, I would argue, doing very quick, very efficient calculations. So I'm going to throw you this docket in just a moment. I hope it reaches you. If you wouldn't mind catching it, that would be absolutely fantastic. Excellent, because that doesn't always happen. Thank you. As it came flying towards you, did you see any figures flying past your eyes? Did you do any maths at all? You must have done, but you weren't aware. Absolutely, you did. At a subconscious level, let's call and here in the pit of your gut or here in your back of your mind, a very quick and efficient speed and trajectory and parabola calculation. And yet, you weren't aware of it. And we do the same whenever we make a decision. We're constantly weighing up upsides and downsides and probabilities. We know that when we get on a plane or even get in a car, there is a very tiny chance that something terrible could happen. But we take that decision because we know that the chance is small enough. So when we're multiplying our probability by the event, it is a very small risk indeed, even though the event itself could be pretty profound and awful. So we're doing maths, but we're doing it emotionally. We're doing it not according to the actual outcomes, not according to the actual benefit that this decision might have to our organization, no matter how noble and well-meaning we are, we do it according to the meanings that these particular outcomes have to us. And most of the time, unfortunately, as human beings, not all of the time, but most of the time we are subject to a fairly common psychological law. And that is that we get less pleasure from our gains than we get pain from our losses. Not all of us, not all of the time, but most of us a lot of the time. Less pleasure from our, pain, sorry, our gains than we get pain from our losses. If we lost £100 as we were walking around here today, that would hurt. If we found £100 on this, in this kitchen table or outside our front door, that would be nice, but I guarantee you the loss would still hurt. In fact, you'd open your front door going, if I hadn't lost that £100, I'd be £100 up by now. We get less pleasure from our gains than we get pain from our losses. The S-shaped utility curve tells us exactly why we do what we do. So as boring as it is to look at a curve now at uh, 10 to 4 on our Thursday afternoon, let me just put it up and talk us through it. The x-axis measures quantity, quantity of anything, quantity of money, quantity of status, quantity of time, just quantity of something that we have, and the vertical axis measures utility, the level of satisfaction that we get from it. There is a life cycle element to this curve. 
When we are in the realm of appreciating marginal utility, what is happening is that we're getting very little downside if we lose what we have at the moment and a massive upside. Uh, Duncan Bannatyne, one of the dragons in Dragon's Den, says that at the age of 25, he decided to be the next Alan Sugar. And his girlfriend said to him, but you're broke, you have nothing. And he said, absolutely, I have nothing to lose, only upside. And therefore, he took a series of risks. As people who, when they come into an organization and don't know anyone and have very little connection to lose, will tend to want to do brave and daring things because there is only upside. There is only something to gain from doing it. But as we go through our lives or a period of time spent with a group of people, we get to a period here, the diminishing marginal utility curve, where, you know what? If we gain something in quantity, we don't gain that much in terms of actual pleasure, but we now have a great deal to lose. This applies to almost everything in our lives, not just status or reputation, where I think it applies profoundly, but even money, believe it or not. Arnold Schwarzenegger once said, money doesn't make you happy. He said, I've got $50 million in the bank. I'm no happier than when I had $48 million. What he meant by that was, I bet he got a lot of pleasure from the first $2 million, but he got to a time and place in his life where it didn't really matter whether he gained or lost $2 million. I don't know. I don't know Arnold Schwarzenegger personally. Maybe he was here. Maybe if he gains $2 million, he's not getting that much pleasure, but if he loses anything of this... Uh, amount of that he's accrued in his life, maybe he could lose a lot. That is the permafrost. That is what Gus is talking about. That is what causes that. Now, I'm generalizing massively, and Eleanor has given me permission to say that today, because I'm not talking about Eleanor personally or any one person personally. But in general, any organization has a group of people who, when they come in, want to do a lot of brave and exciting things, but who get to a stage where they have a nice house, a nice car, a beautiful relationship, a family, uh, a lot of respect in an organization, they have a lot to lose. There is a layer above that where some to lose, some to gain, don't really care. But the interesting thing about human decision making is that very often the reason why people don't take risks, why people don't invest something, is that in order to get what they desire, they need to be prepared to lose what they have in the short term. And the reason why they don't make that investment is because you know what? Have a look at this line here, and this is the most difficult thing for us all to accept sometimes as human beings. We don't necessarily want what we say we want that much. There's a poker player called Phil Ivey who says, the will to win is not the problem. Everyone has the will to win. The problem is the will to do what it takes to win. So... Our propensity to embrace change, innovation, and risk depends on our level of satisfaction with where we are and what we have now. More dissatisfaction, the more risk we're prepared to embrace. Our real desires and goals for the future, in other words, how much we really want what we say we want, and the extent to which we are prepared to lose what we have now in order to gain what we desire. With that in mind, let's get some thoughts to what we think here stops us from taking risks. What attitudes, how does that manifest itself in any organization? but in our experience of the civil service. Who would like to kick us off? Anyone at all? Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, madam. We thought there was three elements. Um, one was cost, particularly in the civil service. It's not um, sort of your own money you're risking, it's taxpayers and you're answerable to a lot of people for that. Um, the other's experience in that if you've done things before and they've gone wrong... Talk a little bit louder, a little bit louder. If you've done things before and they've gone wrong, you'd be less likely to, to do them again. Good, excellent. Why? Um, because you fear the failure that Good. you've experienced before. Because you've experienced that pain, yeah. and that memory is pretty profound. Yeah. Yep. And the third one? It's a great list. Um, yeah, the actual um, issues that you would face in taking the risk, um, what you'd have to go through to, to bring that risk in, whether you're prepared to go through that pain to get the gain. Good. And talk about what they are. And I'm going to uh, bring uh, Andrew in on that. So what, what do you have to face? What are the issues? Um, well, for me, at local level, it's things like staff attitudes, um, whether you're going to get the will of your staff on board when you're bringing in another change or another risk, um, whether you can convince management that it's the right way to go, and then senior management. So you're sort of fighting from all angles to, to bring in a change. Okay, great, excellent. Now, Andrew, you've pushed through change and innovation and got people's buy-in. How have you done that? Um, getting people's buy-in, I think, is the hardest thing, but... I I think the key thing is actually when people say no, it's not to try and to steamroll her, it's to kind of test and embrace and explore what the reasons are around those issues. I mean, because I think the point was made earlier, 
we do a lot of things that other people and other organisations don't do. So, you know, if, if Job Centre Plus goes down, that's not really the particularly good situation for the people that are relying on payments there. But there is a whole set of objects which a previous contributor just made mention of. That fear of failure, it kind of feels right out there. And people kind of do think, oh, hang on a second, you know, we've got something that works well. It might not work well enough, but actually... Can we just keep going here? Because we've been through all this before. And there's that whole sequence of how long are we going to tinker with this or do we do it properly? And I think that's quite a compelling and, and profound thing that stops people moving on because actually they don't really believe that this time it's going to work because it didn't work before. And that has to go down to the leadership of, of, of the change programs, I think, that Eleanor made mention of earlier. And then there's personal stuff around blame, and we can all kid ourselves, but it's out there. Um, and when it comes knocking on your door, it's none too pleasant, and that impacts on career and reputation. And actually, innovative behavior isn't always rewarded in the civil service, and risk-taking isn't always rewarded. But failure, um, generally, they track you down and they know where you live. So <laughs> it's a very, very complex issue. Because in an organisation, we're reinforcing less pleasure from gains than pain from losses. Save a million, how much reward do you get? Lose a million, and what's going to happen? Oh, yeah. Or certainly, what's the perception of what's going to happen? Any other things you'd like to say, Andrew? No, okay, great. Eleanor, what is your feeling? Why, why don't we? What is the resistance? Well, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, the resistance is common sense, if I may say so. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the interesting things is that the National Audit Office has, um, has found that uh, in many cases, policymakers in government take enormous risks, uh, quite unconsciously, because they haven't actually assessed them. Um, and one of the things that politicians and therefore senior policymakers who work with them can do is to hold two opposing ideas in their mind at the same time and um, reconcile them by virtue of clever drafting. Now, when a policy idea like that comes up against the reality of an IT project, of um, uh, costs, or of the behavior of the British public, then everything can go pear-shaped. So I would say um, that actually sometimes we're right not to take risks um, because, uh, because failure is almost guaranteed in the way that we have designed the policy because we've ignored how it's going to be operated on the ground. And we have to take that into account. Good, excellent, thank you, Elena. Any other points from the audience? Any other thoughts? Please uh, put your hand up. Yes, one at the front here, thank you. I think with regards to taking a, a risk, uh, myself personally, I think it's the support you actually get, uh, maybe from the manager. I think if you fail to make a decision, that's a decision within itself. Um, so you've already made this decision. So, you know, I decided to step out um, and engage the individuals that I thought uh, were able, maybe from IT and different various um, department sectors. And um, my idea, it actually worked. And I think that, you know, you should be your own cheerleader um, and you should also be prepared to step out because if, if you don't, you, you'll never know. Um, so that's my, my view anyway. And sometimes I think that the individuals themselves, it may be someone of a, on, a, on a high level, that they're not actually qualified to sanction or they, have, they don't have, actually have the knowledge in order to authorise your decision and, and to support and back you. Right, great, excellent. So, so you're getting resistance from people on a higher level and we'll, we'll, let's, we'll, let's, we'll call that the permafrost again. Okay. Now let's, what we need to do is, whenever you're playing poker, we always need to understand the mind of the opponent. So let's just get into their mind just for a moment, because here's the decision that they want you to make, which is safe and secure. Right? And in their mind, they're doing this calculation, like my catching friend here did a calculation. We're not aware of that calculation, but they feel that decision is sort of worth 3,500. That's the return that they're going to get if you make a nice, safe decision. Right? And what you're saying is, if I take a risk, a greater risk, then I'm going to have the potential to do something much greater. Yes, there'll be some short-term pain and some, some failures, and you know, we're, we're learning a new skill, but look at the return I'm going to get in the long term. That's what you're saying. But this person who doesn't know this situation very well and feels that they only have something to lose, they're getting less pleasure from these potential gains and these losses. And that's 
the maths that they do. Have a look at that for a moment. Look at their upside. While your upside is 20,000, 10,000, they are interpreting that as only 8,000 and 6,000 because that line, remember, flattened off. There's no more emotional gain that they can make from this. It's not going to be that massive for them. It is for you, but not for them. But look now at these downsides. If you experience a failure, they feel it's going to reflect on them. And we get more pain from failures than we get pleasure from gains. So instead of just 110 there, emotionally, and this is the way that people make decisions in deal or no deal, they're processing that as big negative numbers issues that they're going to have to sort out. So now, instead of this 7,500 gain that you feel you're going to make, they've reduced it down to just 2,250, which is less than the safe decision. That's what risk aversion does to people. Less pleasure from gains than pain from losses means that they value new opportunities less than safe decisions, even though objectively they're worth more. So. How can we change this? How can we change this? Let's start with our panel. Andrew, how can we change this? How can we change the situation that this gentleman finds himself in? Um, well, Gus uses the phrase, ask forgiveness, not permission. And I actually believe Gus believes that. But I kind of don't believe everybody in other departments does. So actually, there's something around making that statement truthful uh, and allowing people to make informed decisions around risk, not silly decisions around risk, uh, but just being explicit. And part of that has to be, as Eleanor said, about being explicit with ministers about the risk. And ultimately, the decision is theirs, and they can take the decision that they wish around particular policies. But it's our job to put the practicalities and the risks around that on the table. But until we get a kind of honest narrative around this, it's always going to be difficult. But that puts pressure on us to actually replicate that kind of, and it's a dread word, and I don't like using it, but I can't think of a, another one, a, a culture where we can actually take that step forward. And I think that's hard, but, you know, I've, I've worked with Gus, and he does believe that. Um, and, and I've um, made some bad decisions, and I, and I was still there at the end of it, and we understood why. So I think that's, a, that, for me, that's the most important aspect of it. Great, excellent. I'm going to bring Eleanor in, and then uh, the audience folks, so please have your points ready. Yeah, Eleanor. I think we, we need a change in culture, but we also need to have the skills to assess risks objectively and put the appropriate value on them so that they're neither too high or too low, uh, so that we actually put the, the correct value, the 3,500 or whatever it might be, on the risk, both for our managers, for ministers, and whoever may be involved, so that we look at it clearly and honestly. Is there a, a roaming team that does anything like that at the moment, Eleanor? Are there departments that take that responsibility for analysis? Uh, th there are risk managers in many departments who do take the uh, do take responsibility for that. But when we when we talk about risk, do they deal with risk with a capital R, like fire and flood and IT breakdown, or do they do they an analyse decisions? They will they will analyse uh, the decisions of, of the whole management of the department and its policies. So. Um, that they'll cover the whole spectrum. Okay, great, excellent. Uh, gentleman here in the front row, please, uh, with the microphones, and then anyone else, if you put your hand up now, we'll get a microphone to you straight away. Not one there, please, thank um, you. One, yes. One, one of the features of the private sector is if, if a company is going to take a risky business uh, venture in a particular area, a particular um, direction, uh, they will typically look to see whether they can kind of ensure some of that risk, you know, maybe they'll take out a derivative or
Great. So insurance is mitigation. Uh, we have a, quick, a point at the back there. Yeah. The risk of um, being sort of uh, slightly controversial. Um, you, you can take a risk. So in this session, you can take a risk. That's great. Um, I, I think the basic proposition appears to be that, that, that the civil service is not good at taking risk. And that's absolutely absurd. The civil service takes risks all the time. Um, and quite frankly, in comparison with um, some private organizations, take considerably more risks than private organizations do. Um, that's certainly been my experience. Uh, as a lawyer, we, we tend to manage those risks because a lot of the policy comes down to making law, etc. Et um, uh, and so I think that if we are concerned about risk and taking risks, then we need to inculcate a system whereby we, we, we take those risks. So in other words, we need to have a, a risk assessment practice built into our policy process, which is, which is absolutely fine. We can, we can do that. Um, and just to pick up on one point, um, we don't choose our jobs on the basis of <coughs> risk. If we all wanted to have a risky job, we'd all be go, go and become stuntmen. We choose to work in the civil service because A, it offers a wonderfully varied career, um, and because we enjoy working for the public. That is what we do, and that is what we're about. We don't work because we're after the money, et cetera, et cetera. So just to come back to a point that was made by one of your panelists. Sure, right? sure, sure. Fantastic contribution. Thank you very much indeed. And I would like to say that if I've given the wrong uh, impression, that I'd like to take it back. Because in my experience of working 80% with the private sector and 20% with the public sector, in my experience, there is no difference. I actually agree with you. I think the public sector embraces very large risks, largely for the reasons that, uh, that our two contributors there pointed out, which is that they should and they have to, and they're populated with people who want to give public service. But what I would observe is that, uh, two points, both people in the private and public sector always feel frustrated. There's a degree of frustration across both. There's a perception in the public sector that the private sector have it more easy in this regard, and I don't actually think that they do because of accountability in the short term to shareholders, but that there is probably more frustration in the public sector. So in a way, what we're trying to ask is how can we alleviate that frustration? Not necessarily even make different decisions, but understand that your great point, that we are taking risks all the time. Andrew. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I want to just add to that. I and mean, I agree with the point entirely, but it's just one of those little soft indicators. And just next time you're at a meeting, which involves a risk register, just check where it is on the agenda or in the papers. Yeah, because in the civil service, it's generally at the back. Yeah. And it never, we never get there quick enough. So we've done the work, but it's just never, just never want to be quite as cognizant with that risk and spend the time on it as we might. Because we've, we've reduced it to a process, we've got it right. Those risks are all there, and we've got all the mitigation in there, and we've got the awareness. We never quite have the time to talk about them. Yeah, it's just always slightly over the prow of the hill. Great. Jonathan, I'm going to bring you in in just a minute to, uh, to, uh, to, to, with some closing thoughts. But I just want to, uh, last seven minutes, three minutes of which, a little bit of theory on this subject, because obviously if we don't answer this from some sort of theoretical level, then we're, uh, we're wanting somehow. The answer for me is that we all have to project ourselves into the long term, because ultimately that's where we're trying to get to. By long term, I don't mean five years or ten years. I mean, actually, like any good economist, whatever we want it to mean, our long term is our ultimate goal or objective. Because for all of us here in this room, failure ultimately is not an option. Failure to deliver, failure to give full value to uh, taxpayers is not an option. That's what we're all dedicated to doing. So, how can I reconcile that with some of the things that I've said which necessitate embracing failure and some short-term pain, as I use the phrase? Long-term failure is not an option. But if our long-term goals are stretching enough and demanding enough, now in the private sector they are, you know, bottom line profit, but if they are return, if they are value, if they are degree of service, and if those goals are stretching enough and demanding enough, then short-term failure is a necessity in order to achieve that because of the way that risk and opportunity work. My example of this is Lawrence Delalio. I'm fortunate enough to do some work with Lawrence because I have uh, an agent who puts me together with sports people who are always two foot taller than me, I tend to find. Uh, I don't know if we have any rugby fans here, but you'll know that Lawrence is not a man who likes the word failure in any shape or form. And Lawrence and I needed to harmonize our message in some way, and that posed a challenge because Lawrence is talking about no failure on any uh, account, and I'm talking about embracing it. But what we realized was that Lawrence, in order to achieve his lifelong dream and ambition, which was to hold the World Cup in his hands, in order to achieve that long-term goal, needed to embrace short-term failure on a daily basis. Where? There, on the training ground. 
The whole process of training involves setting the bar higher, failing, 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 achieving it, inculcating it, setting it higher again, so that you were doing better things than the opposing team. The interesting thing is that because it was an accepted part of getting to where they wanted to get to in the long term, they didn't call it failure, they just called it part of the process. In exactly the same way that a marketing director sends out 1,000 brochures and 960 of them end up on the floor or in the bin, he doesn't call those failures because he knows that the 40 that succeed more than pay for the 960 that end up in the bin. Call center is exactly the same. Average telesales call operator has a 10% hit rate. Doesn't matter. The 90% of time that's invested in the people that say no is necessary in order to get to the long-term goal. In other words, what I'm saying is that the more we embrace and accept short-term failure on the altar of achieving our long-term goal, the more that we stop even calling it failure anymore. We're always trying to improve our success rate, our hit rate, but we don't wake up in the middle of the night panicking because 96% of our brochures are ending up on the floor. We don't end up panicking because it's taken some time and effort. Maybe that's six weeks, maybe it's six months, maybe it's even longer in order for us to change our process from one to another because of the gains that this new process will utilize. In other words, by taking a long-term perspective, we've become terrified of what we could lose and we've become energized by what we could gain. And this line that's flattened out here is the fact that mentally we've accepted that we need to make a short-term loss in order to make that long-term gain. Today is not about gambling. I don't know how many people we have here who have ever gambled in a casino, but I'll wager that every single one of you that did went in with one attitude between you. And that is, I've got 30 pounds in my pocket, and I'm happy to lose it. That is how 98% of people, the attitude that they have when they walk into a casino. That is what allows them to engage in this activity, which consciously they know they're going to lose money. Sadly, 2% of people have a different attitude, but has the same result. 2% of people go in with the attitude, which is, I'm already 5,000 pounds down, I now need to just double up and get that money back. But the attitude is the same, it means that I'm not gonna experience any more pain of loss. It's a very tragic attitude, but the result is the same. I'm not gonna experience the pain of loss. So as teams, what we're really trying to do is focus on our long-term goals, and that's why if anyone wants copies of these slides, by the way, please give me your details. Here are five questions which can really help a team from any sector really break through a fear of failure, a risk aversion, in order to achieve what we want to achieve. What are our long-term goals? Let's focus on those. What will be the consequences of not achieving them? Because the more profound that they are, the more determined we're going to be to do so. What risks, potential short-term failures, are unacceptable? What exists on this side of this line? What are we not prepared to do? Whether it's because it's the effect on one or more of our stakeholders or the potential consequence to us personally. Nothing wrong with having unacceptable risks. But crucially then, folks, what risks, i.e. potential short-term failures, must we embrace in order to achieve them? What opportunities do we need to seize, some of which will result in failure, in order to achieve the long-term goals that we're agreed upon and which are going to demand some degree of change? Jonathan, you're putting a, a change uh, program into practice at the moment. What do you feel as a sort of summary and conclusion to today? Well, well, the first thing I want to say, I'm partly prompted by the comments over there. You know, after two and a half months in the civil service, my impressions are that this is a fantastic place, and I don't want some of my comments earlier to be taken as negative. I've met amazing people, many of whom, as you and others have said, are motivated by wanting to make a difference and wanting to serve. I also think the quality of thinking in the public sector is way ahead of the private sector. The focus on evidence, the, the thinking cross-cutting, the systematic, the systemic thinking rather, it is far ahead of the private sector. And we shouldn't idolize the private sector. There have been many, like Enron and others, big spectacular failures and very, very bad practice. So there's a lot of good things here. What, what lacks sometimes for me here is pace. It's that sense of urgency. Uh, I think it may be partly the, the, just the whole kind of way the civil service is set up. We sort of wait for ministers. This is an exaggeration, but, you know, wait for ministers to tell us what to do. Uh, I, I think we, we could be more proactive and faster, particularly in the current context. And, and the, the gentleman who spoke earlier about sort of, the, you know, the options as time goes on versus uh, the, the, the kind of amount of information we have for decision making, I think that's critical for us now. Uh, and uh, certainly in my organization, in terms of change, the, the key thing that uh, I'm trying to push in my colleagues is really around energy, pace, speed, getting things to move and change faster. That, that's the critical thing. And I think when we talk about 
people engagement, in the end, that's what that's all about. It's helping people, as, as you said, you've got ideas, you need to be your own cheerleader. We as managers and leaders need to get out of people's way and help you to do what you want to do. Great, thank you. Andrew, final thoughts? Um, I think it's a different environment we work in to the pro private sector. It's actually much more complex. I mean, I kind of go back to DWP, spend a billion a week on pensions. You can't afford to mess up there. I mean, that's really serious big business. We are big business, and we do have to operate differently. But I agree with the issues around pace, and I certainly agree with the issues around experimentation and the application of the lessons of those experiments. Because what we tend to do is work fairly insularly, test, uh, evaluate, put it on the shelf somewhere and not build on it. So I think we do a lot of the risky stuff, and it's a question of how we actually apply it much more systematically. Thank you, Andrew. And finally, Eleanor, someone who's uh, leaving this week. What are your final thoughts here at the civil service? Final, final thoughts at a personal level, really, rather than at uh, the grand civil service level. I think that the way to get better at taking risks is to take some risks. So take some small risks, um, and you may find that you get happier about taking the larger risks. Great. Thank you, Elena. Folks, I know your time has been a limited resource, and I appreciate your investment of it here today. Uh, myself and the panel are around if you want to ask any final questions, but for now, thank you very much indeed.